Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Okay, so we're back again for the second lecture this week, and uh, what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to start the discussion of uh, an equation that tries to describe the motion of these de Broglie matter waves that we introduced in the last lecture. Um, now this is a challenging uh, subject to explain. Um, let me just say up front that um, it really involves, it really to understand it, really requires you to transfer uh, your understanding from other areas of physics and engineering. So this is an example of a learning transfer where you're going to take knowledge that you've already got, uh, doesn't uh, uh, completely apply to a problem at hand, but it's close enough. That, uh, you can take the concepts, uh, tweak the concepts a little bit, and come up with a solution uh, to a, a problem that otherwise uh, had no solution. So this is essentially what Schrodinger uh, went through when he uh, derived his equation. And I always like to point out that, uh, that his work was uh, one of the first examples of learning transfer. This is a topic that uh, you'll hear a lot about if you, if you go to conferences and uh, try to understand how better to teach to uh, students and have a discussion about learning transfer. Uh, Schrodinger somehow uh, pulled this off without even knowing uh, the words in the context of the words. Um, there are two choices that I have in preparing this lecture. Um, it's actually a dilemma. One uh, choice is I could just write down Schrodinger's equation, which is written in this yellow box, and I can say, this is it. Uh, the other uh, option that I can try to follow is I can try to make that equation plausible and somewhat understandable to you. So I'm going to follow the second option, um, and in the process I'm going to be transferring information uh, from other branches of physics to try to make the, uh, the derivation of that equation plausible. I will state up front that I cannot derive it. Uh, it's not a, a, an equation that you can derive, it's just an equation that you can make plausible. And then the validity of the equation is always, uh, uh, does it explain experimental data? The fact that it does uh, proves that, uh, that uh, it's, it's a, a real theory of, of nature. So, uh, just to quickly review the notation that we've um, uh, covered so far, uh, you, if you stick with this course through the whole semester, you'll realize it's a, it's a spiral course. It, we keep coming back to similar concepts time and time again. And uh, this is another example where we're just reviewing notation and ideas that we've already discussed. Uh, if you have some confusion about these ideas uh, and you don't clear up that confusion at an early stage, uh, you'll just you'll just get uh, hopelessly lost in this course. So what I've done here is I've, I've tried to pull together some of the important equations that we've discussed in the first week of the course. The uh, first equation here is, is the speed of light is equal to the frequency times the wavelength of light. Uh, we've got the uh, Planck's Feynman's equation for the photon energy E. Uh, we've got the Maxwell's equation for the momentum of an electromagnetic wave in terms of the energy U that's contained in it and the speed of light C. We uh, define the concept of a photon. Right, the momentum of a photon is, is given by Planck's constant h divided by the wavelength of the photon. And from that concept, uh, Broglie said, well, maybe light, or I'm sorry, maybe matter, maybe particles have wavelengths oh, with, given by the Broglie wavelength. It's, it's very similar in form to the uh, uh, wavelength land of a photon in terms of its momentum p. So. Uh, this, this gives rise to the definition of the Broglie wavelength. And then last we, lastly, we can always write the, the momentum of a particle P, right, in terms of the Broglie wavelength by multiplying and dividing by 2 pi. This gives rise to this famous uh, formula, P is equal to H bar K, that we'll see over and over again in, in the, the rest of this week. So 
uh, you should have some understanding of those equations and know when to use them and when they might be valid. So um, the, the premise of this lecture is to uh, just basically uh, uh, write down an equation that describes how these matter waves, the, the, the Broglie hypothesis, how they change uh, with position and time. Well, one of the important questions to ask is, uh, is there any prior information out there that might be useful uh, in writing down this equation? And uh, there is, there's a, there's a lot of prior work. I, I like to cite Hamilton's work in 1830, uh, where he basically uh, uh, derived this conservation of energy concept, uh, which I'd like to, like to review. That's going to be one of the important concepts that underlies Schrodinger's equation. So there are some uh, ideas from prior work that Schrodinger was able to borrow and modify, uh, but the end result, of course, is uh, a very creative piece of mathematics uh, that uh, has survived for over 100 years and uh, uh, is, is one of the major tools of science and engineering uh, that we use today. Uh, so again, uh, Schrodinger's equation can't be derived. It's, it's sort of like Newton's F equals ma. You can't derive that equation. You can make it plausible. And uh, once you write it down, you can use it and try to uh, understand what it predicts. And then you can compare those predictions to experiment. Um, uh, Schrodinger's equation is, is ultimately justified by its excellent agreement with experimental data. Uh, this equation solves a large number of problems in quantum physics and atomic physics. Uh, as long as the, uh, the energy of the electrons or the energy of the particles is non-relativistic. So if, uh, if the speed of the objects that we're trying to uh, uh, study, if that speed starts to approach the speed of light, then you have to fix up Schrodinger's equation and include relativistic effects. We'll do a little bit of that at the end of the semester, but not a whole lot. Right? So uh, uh, let's let's uh, let's sort of ask the question where to start. And uh, the way we're going to start is we're going to insist that Hamilton's ideas about conservation of energy are going to apply to uh, quantum particles. And that just simply means that uh, if we write the total energy of a particle as E, then it's going to be equal to the sum of a potential energy and a kinetic energy. Now, the potential energy basically tells how that particle interacts with its environment. So whatever problem you set up, or whatever problem you try to solve, you have to have the correct potential energy in that problem in order to describe how the particle is interacting with the world around it. The kinetic energy, on the other hand, is a little bit simpler to understand. The kinetic energy is just p squared over 2m. This is equivalent to 1 half mv squared. Okay. So uh, the other two important ideas are the, uh, the energy is equal to uh, Planck's constant 8 times the frequency f. And uh, the momentum of a particle is equal to Planck's constant h divided by lambda. So those are those are other equations that we like to see uh, eventually come out of any theory of quantum mechanics. Uh, and uh, these three these three equations on the top of this slide are, are sort of like the benchmarks that any theory is going to have to be compared against because you like to believe these these results are going to uh, come out. All right. So, um, uh, this just tries to summarize the, the conservation of energy idea. And it's kind of important because we use it over and over again. The idea is simple. If you have a particle, let's say, a particle's on top of a hill. The shape of the hill is, is then a description of the potential energy that the particle is going to experience. For instance, that is, for instance, if you hold the particle down the hill. Right. If the particle, ener particle has a total energy E, then you would like to believe that as the potential energy changes, the kinetic energy also changes to keep the sum of the potential and kinetic energies equal to uh, a constant. Right. So uh, 
any any equation that we're going to derive, we'd like to have this conservation of energy concept built in to begin with. And uh, what we'd like to do is we'd like to just think about wave-like equations that have been written down in the past and see if we can derive some insight into what direction we should uh, take this discussion. Uh, uh, and, uh, to do that, again, I'd like to review the wave equation that we discussed last week about the wave on a string. So here we have a string, two fixed boundary conditions, right? Uh, if we cause a disturbance in that string, uh, the disturbance is, is defined as this, this, this quantity h, is, and h is going to depend on position x and also on time t, right? Uh, what we say is we say we can describe the motion of the string if we can calculate h as a function of x and t. Well, what equation does h satisfy? Well, it's going to, as we discussed last week, right, it's going to satisfy a wave equation. And what we're going to do is we're going to write down this disturbance h in terms of as a product of two, uh, two functions. One is strictly a function of x. The other is an oscillatory function of time t. Right? And, and the frequency omega, the angular frequency omega, is going to describe how that spring vi vibrates or as a function of time. Right? You can take this idea, this equation, this is a, a hypothetical solution to this equation. You can take this, plug it into this equation, and you can evaluate both the left and the right-hand side of the equation. I work out the algebra, and what you find is you find something very interesting. You find that the time-dependent part of the solution drops out because it shows up at both the left and the right-hand side of the equation. And you're then left with an equation that uh, describes just the spatial disturbance f of x, right? And, and this equation has a special form. It's referred to as an eigenvalue problem, right? And an eigenvalue problem says if you take a function f of x and you operate it on it by some, some, com some complicated uh, derivative, you get the function f of x back again times something, right? And this something is referred to as the eigenvalue of this eigen uh, uh, of this eigen front of this eigenvalue uh, equation, right? So f of x is referred to as the eigenfunction. The quantity in parentheses is referred to as the eigenvalue, and this is a standard eigenvalue problem, which basically can be written as some operator operating on the function gives something back again times the same function, right? And so since this is a standard solution to all wave equations, why not insist that uh, uh, this, this uh, equation for de Broglie matter waves, why not insist that it have uh, this eigenvalue form to it? Um, so here, here uh, I just summarize what I've already said, right? The, the key insight from looking at the classical wave equation is that the operator does not change the function, but just scales it by a multiplicative factor. Whenever you, whenever you have a situation like that, that's referred to as an eigenvalue problem. Um, so, uh, the first question that we're going to ask is, what, what, what parameter do we use to characterize this matter wave? And uh, the parameter that Schrodinger uh, selected was, was uh, the wave wave function psi is, is going to describe this matter wave. And the second question is, how might this matter wave change with time? Right? And what we're going to do is we're going to say that uh, uh, maybe the wave function psi is governed by an eigenvalue equation. So if that is true, right, then possibly uh, an equation that describes how this this matter wave psi evolves with time, is the time derivative of psi is equal to something times the wave function psi back again. Right? So that might be a, a logical place to start the discussion. Right? It doesn't mean that the, uh, uh, this is the final equation, but it's a starting point. So what type of function psi obeys this type of an equation? Well, one thing you might think of is, well, try a sine or a cosine, because those are, those are very familiar functions from uh, uh, optics and 
from our study of electromagnetic waves. So I just worked through the case. I do the algebra here for uh, 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 the case that the wave function psi is, status is equal to A times the cosine of Kx minus omega t. So the argument of the cosine is familiar to you as a traveling wave. Uh, a is the amplitude of that wave. And, and uh, this, this cosine function is then going to be used in this, this hypothetical equation to see if we can actually solve it. Well, <clears throat> if you work through the arithmetic, what you'll find is that when you take the derivative of psi with respect to t, the cosine gets turned into a sine. And then the question is, is the derivative of psi with respect to t equal to something times the function itself, a cosine of kx minus omega t? And the answer is no, it's not. Uh, and it's, it's even worse than that, because you can't just do something uh, that turns this cosine of kx minus omega t. You can't easily turn that into a sine function, right? Not by simple multiplication. Right? Uh, in order to turn the cosine into a sine, you've got to do a phase shift. And so uh, these, these simple uh, solutions based on sines and cosines will not satisfy this, this hypothetical eigenvalue equation up here. Right? We need another function. Uh, Schrodinger uh, hypothesized that the solution uh, for this wave function psi uh, is a complex function. And this was one of his insights. Um, and so instead of writing uh, psi as just either a cosine or a sine, uh, Schrodinger said, why not write uh, psi in terms of a, a, a complex function, which has a, a spatial dependent part, e to the i k sub x x, times a, a time dependent part, e to the minus i omega t. Right, so this, this quantity k sub x, this is going to be related to the Broglie wavelength in the x direction, right? and omega is going to be related to the energy that the particle has uh, by uh, equals uh, h bar omega. Right? So does that uh, 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 equation for psi satisfy this time-dependent uh, equation, this time-dependent eigenvalue equation? Uh, well, you can, you know, you can take the derivative of this with respect to time. That's easy to do. You get this minus i omega out in front. You get the wave function back. It's back again, right? Because every every time you take the derivative of an exponential function, you always get that exponential function back again. That's one of the beauties of, of the exponent. So, <clears throat> with uh, this uh, proposed uh, uh, solution. You do have an eigenvalue uh, problem. Uh, the eigenvalue problem can be even uh, transformed into something even more interesting by simply multiplying both the left and right hand side of this equation by ih bar. So if you multiply both the left and the right by ih bar, what you'll find is that, that you've got an operator i h bar times the partial with respect to t operating on the wave function psi equal to h bar omega, which is the energy uh, of the particle, times the wave function psi back again. Right? So the eigenvalue of this equation uh, now becomes just h bar omega. And so we've got an equation that specify, uh, specifies the, uh, the energy eigenvalue of, of, of of this time-dependent change in the wave function, if this equation actually, in fact, does describe these Broglie waves. So uh, this is the first part uh, in the discussion of Schrodinger's equation. In the next lecture, we're going to actually uh, set this total energy E equal to the sum of the potential plus the kinetic energy, which is what you would exactly expect if you followed Hamilton's logic to describe particle motion. Right? You like to believe that the total energy E of a particle is equal to the sum of its potential plus kinetic energy. So we're going to put that part in in the next lecture, and uh, we'll see that when we do that, we end up with an equation that, uh, that was written down by Schrodinger in 1926. So we'll see you for that next lecture in a few minutes.